get it just in here. Okay. Hello, my name is Stephen D'Esposito, and I'm going to do a little speech about Giuseppe Archimboldo, which I've nicknamed the Divine Joker. Now, Giuseppe Archimboldo um, has created a bunch of composite headpieces as a form of entertainment, and I want to develop this idea that they were meant to be fun and playful. So, Giuseppe Archimboldo, the Divine Joker, um, he had fun as a portrait artist by, by creating things in a new and unique way. Um, a basic life history that I got from Warner Kriegis Court's Giuseppe Archimboldo book is that he was born in 1527 and he was born into the family of an artist. His father was an artist and his father worked in the Milan Cathedral. So Giuseppe Archimboldo was brought up uh, doing artwork. He was probably apprenticed under his father. Um, and in 1549, he's recognized for his first independent work. And he's recognized as doing stained glass in the Milan Cathedral. And it had spiritual uh, connotations of saints and angels and that sort of thing. Um, and then in 1562, he was appointed as a court portrait artist. And he moved to Vienna to work for the Habsburg family. And he remained working for the Habsburg family for more than 25 years for the Habsburg dynasty. And in 1566, he created a series of paintings called The Elements. And the elements consisted of fire, air, earth, and water. And of these four paintings, I'm going to talk a little bit about the painting of water in a little bit here. And in 1587, he returns to Milan. Uh, to his homeland, and he continues to work for the Habsburg family, even though he leaves their um, area, their domain, and he passes away in Milan in 1593. Now, according to Thomas de Costa Kaufman in his book Archimboldo, um, he was considered, Archimboldo was considered to be the Habsburg's Leonardo, referring to Leonardo da Vinci, because an artist at that time was supposed to be well versed in all kinds of knowledge, not just artwork. And Archimboldo was. He was versed in astrology and he was a party planner and he worked as an engineer and an architect and he also worked with uh, specimens from nature. So all of these things that he did and all of these areas that he covered um, contributed to his artwork and contributed to the ideas that he had. He also created ciphers. Uh, he, he did a lot of different things other than just artwork throughout his life. Now, um, the piece water that I want to focus on today, I have some basic information from the website Giuseppe, Giuseppe Archimboldo, The Complete Works. First of all, it's, a, it's an oil on wood panel, which was a pretty common medium for that time. I believe it was a lime wood panel. They knew what the wood was and they knew that it came from a forest close to where he worked. And it is approximately 67 by 52 centimeters or 20 by 26 inches roundabout. It was created in 1566 and it's commonly classified as a late Renaissance mannerism painting. Um, mannerism think refers more to the time period that it was created and there's a lot of nuances about the way they were made and they were very well constructed but a lot of them were uh, strange forms um, they were sometimes considered grotesques and, and odd um, odd ways that people would pose in unnatural ways uh, but also, his paintings have been associated with Dada, Surrealism, Naturalism, according to Jed Pearl in uh, an art review in the New Republic magazine. And it's also been associated with Still Life and Realism by Thomas de Costa Kaufman. Now, I want to introduce the painting. I'm going to have my assistant bring my camera over. Thank you, Madeline. Now, the painting itself right here is water. Now on the back, the original name of the painting was Aqua. It was labeled Aqua on the back side, maybe in the corner somewhere. And Aqua is the Latin name for water. So that would be the subject matter, so to speak. 
And the subject matter, as it suggests, is there's fish and aquatic species all throughout this painting. Now, at first glance, you would see maybe the profile of a person, but instantly you know that there's something wrong because of the colors. It's not just a profile. It's not just a portrait of a person. So right away you start to inspect closer and you see all of the little aquatic species and it follows this theme throughout. It even has uh, pearls, so it's adorned with jewelry, but the pearl necklace still sticks with the aquatic theme. Now the other thing is uh, this is, I got some of this information in Vincent Vinswade's book, The Artificial and the Natural, that it contains at least 62 species of aquatic creatures, which is an important thing because the species and the aquatic creatures in here are not conceived species. These are very carefully depicted uh, species that you would really find. There, there's nothing in here that is not a natural species. It's a true representation. Of, of aquatic species. Now the, um, the content of the painting can be taken a little bit differently. You would need to know a little bit maybe about the times so that the audience would have to know a little bit more about the painting to understand the content. But um, Sylvia Farino Pagden from the National Gallery of Art show had uh, written in the brochure for that show that this is to be considered praises to his king, political allegories symbolizing peace and prosperity. So this was very carefully selected and put together for a select audience of rich and powerful people. So the audience, the people that would be viewing this, was a limited group of people. It wasn't for the general public. Um, and the brush strokes and the colors if we get into the artistic form, are very smooth with very well blended colors. Um, there's a, a pretty good contrast between the dark background and the fish, which gives a pretty predominant outline, so you can clearly make out that it's a profile of a person also. Um, and the, the relative sizes of the fish are not consistent. Obviously, like there's a crab in the corner as a shoulder, and the crab is way out of proportion from um, a seal. You know, a seal, if it was done to proportion, would cover the entire head. So the proportions were changed in an effective way so that he could create things where he wanted them, like the idea of getting the eye just in the right place and just the right size mouth with maybe the color of the lips from the shark. So he very carefully changed the sizes so that he can create a little bit of ambiguous, ambiguous uh, scene here to catch your attention. And I think also I want to point out that in the context of the 16th century, they didn't have a lot of sensory input like we do now with video games and TV and billboards and uh, electric lights. So for somebody in the 16th century to look at a painting like this, it would be puzzling to the eyes. It would be a puzzle. It would be a little bit of a riddle. And it would be a lot of sensory input. It would be like going to the movies and seeing a Transformer movie maybe to us. Um, and Critics over time have said different things about it, of course. Um, Abigail Tucker of the Smithsonian Magazine says that it was well received during his time. His patrons had a sense of humor. Now his patrons, like I said, were the Habsburgs dynasty. So I think maybe they had a, a sense of humor in a different sense than what I think of as humor, like something to laugh at. They had a sense of humor in the sense that they wanted to be amused, so it, it gave them maybe a jitty, jittery, happy feeling as a, as a sense of humor. They were humored by it. Now in 1936, because Archimboldo had fell into relative obscurity after his death, but he was reintroduced in 1936 uh, with a show at the Museum of Modern Art exhibition called The Fantastic Art Dada Surrealism. 
and so these were new and different art forms that were that were very avant-garde they were very new so he was you know in 1936 400 something years later being compared to some things that were new and different now Jed Pearl um, had written an article and he said that uh, Archimboldo is a connoisseur of strangeness, a minister of surprises, in search of a form that violates the norm. And again, to me, this refers to something that would be associated with avant-garde, something new, something different, because he's violating the norm. This is definitely something out of the norm, even for his time. And then uh, curator of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., David Brown, says that Archambolo's composites were a source of amusement and entertainment. So again, we're continuing with the idea that people right away see the amusement and the entertainment in this. It's fun. These are fun things to look at. Uh, Thomas DaCosta Kaufman say that his paintings may be interpreted as jokes intended to compliment patrons. Anything else would be foolish. And of course they'd be foolish. In the 16th century, not only would he not be employed, he wouldn't have anywhere else to be employed if he uh, did anything but entertain and cater to the people that he worked for. He may not even uh, have his head attached to his body if he didn't um, do things that put his uh, Holy Roman emperors on a pedestal and praise them in some way. As a matter of fact, he would have long poems to go along with his artwork that would explain how he was praising his patrons to be sure that he wasn't making fun of them. He was having fun with them. Now, in conclusion, I want to say a couple of things about my opinion. First of all, I think art should be fun. I think that we shouldn't try to analyze it too much. I think we should look at it and enjoy it for what it is. Um, I think that possibly this was, in his time, a catalog of illustrations. Archimboldo was involved in illustrating a lot of books and scientific studies, and this would be an interesting way to put pages and pages and pages of information into one painting for the sake of discussion. Maybe a rich man's game, maybe um, some of these people of wealth and power would show their wealth and power and their knowledge, which is a form of power, by pointing out all of the creatures that they can find and that they know and that they have dominion and power over. And also I think that this painting draws me in. This painting is, is fun because it's like a word puzzle or a word search or uh, something to that effect where you're constantly looking for new things or trying to identify them just like maybe somebody in the past has done. I mean, we know that we have a sea turtle. We know what a sea turtle looks like. But then we have these other creatures hidden in the dark with a craggly face, and you just kind of have to reach into it and try and identify it. It makes you maybe want to go find one of those illustrated books of fish so that you can identify it. Now, I'm going to go back, have my assistant go back over here, and I'm going to wrap up a little. Um, in modern times, we have a sculpture by Bernard Cross. He's a French sculpture artist and he created a bust of Einstein. Now this bust of Einstein is theme appropriate just like earth, air, fire, and uh, water. And it has electronic equipment and it has um, electrical devices, all discarded devices. It's a piece of sculpture made from junk. But it's theme appropriate to things that have to do with technology that Einstein would have been involved with in some way. And then I also have an example here of the first experience I had with this painting. It was on a 1974 album by Kansas, and it's relabeled Mask, which it does look like a mask. And this particular painting, I knew nothing about it for all these years. I always thought it was some kind of a representation of maybe a Native American Indian. And the mask, maybe to me, I thought was face paint of some kind, what I've learned differently. And I also want to point out that I have here grade school kids, and they're playing with bananas and grapes and carrot sticks. And it looks like 
maybe some grass or celery or something, and they're creating faces in a very much Archimboldo style. And so to me, kids are the best connoisseurs of art because kids want to have fun. Kids know what fun is, and they're directly involved in having fun in an Archimboldo experiment type style painting. Now, that's all I have. Um, I want to thank you for listening, and I hope that this was a little bit entertaining and informative. And being I have an audience of one, I'll go ahead and see if there's any questions. I do. You do? When, <laughs> would you think that the uh, higher ups, the emperors of that time, were they... Wait a whenever, minute, get in the camera so we can... Okay. See whenever they um, got these pictures and they saw them for the first time, did they maybe think that Archimboldo was funny, like a weirdo, because today whenever we, some artists were like, well they're weird, yes. at first was it like, well that's insane and weird? Well, I don't have a definite answer for that, but I do know that the Habsburg family actually, um, actually embraced the bizarre. They liked big festivals, they liked parties, they wanted weird, they wanted different. So they did think that it was somewhat bizarre, um, and that's what that's what they fostered. That's why they hired Archimboldo because of his bizarreness. So I think they thought it was probably weird, but also when he presented them with these paintings, he had those very long poems. I think the man's name that he worked with was Fonteo. I don't know how to say his name, but he worked with a, a poet that actually helped him to explain these paintings and how they glorified his patrons and and uh, you know they they were looking for the bizarre so hopefully they did think it was weird i think i better wrap up my uh speech though unless you have any real burning questions because we're at 17 and a half minutes and i don't want to overstay my welcome okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you madeline d'esposito for your help with the camera and i hope you enjoyed it thank you for watching